In this video, I'd like to go through the first part of the Unit 6 notes um, that goes over basically the parts of the central nervous system and protection of the central nervous system. So in this video, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about the um, tissue types that make up the brain and spinal cord, you know, what is the central nervous system and protection of the central nervous system and cerebrospinal fluid production and circulation. So uh, to start with, the central nervous system, you probably remember, uh, from, we've discussed this before, is made up of the brain and the spinal cord. So in this picture from our book, they're drawing the peripheral nerves in bright yellow. And so if you could imagine, you know, just severing all of those uh, nerves off of the brain and spinal cord, basically what you've done is you've separated the central nervous system from the peripheral nervous system. So in unit six, the, those are the, our two main topics. So first we talk about the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, which as you can see are physically uh, one piece. And then we'll uh, finish up unit six by talking about the peripheral nervous system, the nerves that are coming off of the brain and spinal cord. So whether you look at the brain or you look at the spinal cord, uh, the central nervous system is made up of uh, tissue types called gray matter and white matter. Hopefully you got to see that in lab. Well, let's take a look at a, a photograph of, this is a human brain, um, and this is a frontal section where if you take a look, a close look at the very outside of the brain, do you notice how it's beige compared to right underneath it, this white area? And so this is the difference. It's actually, you know, visible. The uh, gray matter looks kind of uh, beige. Gray matter is made up of um, neuron cell bodies, unmyelinated axons, uh, glial cells, supporting cells, compared to white matter is predominantly myelinated axons. And so you can get a mix of tissue in white matter and gray matter, but just predominantly, you're looking at neuron cell bodies in gray and um, myelinated axons and white matter. And so what we're thinking is that since there are cell bodies in gray matter, I'm thinking that that's where information is being processed, like we talked about in the last unit, you know, compared to in the white matter, this is myelinated axons. I bet this is an area of information flow, information movement. And so you can see the difference um, in function. And so the brain has gray matter that makes up the outer periphery, at least <clears throat> in most of the areas, the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Uh, and then the spinal cord is actually set up uh, completely opposite that, where the white matter is on the outside and the gray matter is on the inside. Just looking for a picture of it here. So here's a diagram from our book. So this is a cross section through the spinal cord. You can see a vertebra surrounding everything. Okay, here's the cord, and notice how the white matter is on the outside, and then the gray matter is on the inside, so it's opposite that of the brain, but it's still made up of gray matter and white matter. And so that's the first thing that I talk about in the notes, that as far as the histology goes, that you see these two main tissue types, the gray matter and the white matter. And as we talk about different parts of the central nervous system, I'll point out where these are, even though I gave you the basic trend already. And so also, as we know, as far as the composition, the central nervous system is made up of the brain and it's made up of the spinal cord. So here what I'm doing is I'm trying to just give you the basic um, idea as far as structure. So we looked at the arrangement of gray matter and white matter in the brain, how the gray is on the outside and then the white is underneath that. And then as far as regions, the brain is um, made up of four main regions. I'll show you these regions. Um, taking a look at, let's say, um, this image. This is a photo of a human brain. <clears throat> this area is the cerebrum. That's the biggest part. Uh, the cerebellum, that's another main region. This is posterior, so that's in the back. The brain stem is a continuation of the spinal cord. So you can see they severed the spinal cord off here. So that's the brain stem. And then the fourth area of the brain, you can only see when you look inside of the brain. It's called the diencephalon. So I'm going to go back to this picture and uh, show you that this area is the diencephalon. It's like the central core of the brain. Okay, so um, the brain is not completely solid. I'm, I'm not sure if you've looked at this yet, but 
there's actually hollow cavities within the brain. They're called ventricles. And these ventricles, we have four of them, are interconnected. And so I'm going to show you a picture from the book, a diagram of the ventricles. So here's the brain. And what they're doing is they're making the ventricles uh, bright blue. So this is kind of making like the brain transparent and the ventricles bright blue just so we can see them. But of course, these are, you know, like in the core of the brain. We can't see them from the outside, really. So there are these two kind of upside down C's. Those are the lateral ventricles. Uh, they are named right and left. They're just called the lateral ventricles. And they connect with the third ventricle. And then this area right in front of the cerebellum, this is the fourth ventricle. And you can see how the fourth ventricle is getting going to continue as a canal, and that canal goes right down the middle of the spinal cord. So these ventricles are interconnected, as I mentioned. So the two lateral ventricles are connected to the third ventricle through the interventricular foramina, okay, or foramen, singular, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, uh, attaches the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, and then again, the fourth ventricle continues on as the central canal. So this is a great picture to look at to learn the ventricles. Um, but I'm going to just show you one more because more realistically, uh, the two lateral ventricles are side by side. They're only separated by this little membrane right on midline called the septum pellucidum. Okay, so there are the two lateral ventricles. Here's the interventricular foramen, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct fourth ventricle in front of the cerebellum central canal. Okay, so the cerebrospinal um, fluid is actually produced within the ventricles and circulates throughout the ventricles. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But this is the basic composition of the nervous system, the central nervous system, that is made up of gray matter and white matter, both the brain and spinal cord, and both the brain and spinal cord uh, have these hollow cavities in the middle that are filled with um, cerebrospinal fluid. So this is basically like the roadmap that I wrote out here for um, where the ventricles are. And um, they connect with the central canal. And this is the basic, you know, physical composition of the central nervous system. And so the central nervous system, the uh, brain and the spinal cord, is encased with three layers of membranes called the meninges. Okay, and so these are membranes that cover and protect the entire central nervous system. Like I said, the, it, it encases the brain and the spinal cord as one um, piece. Okay, so there are three layers to the meninges. Uh, the pia mater is the innermost layer. The arachnoid is the middle layer. And then the dura mater is the outer layer. And I'm going to show you some pictures so it's not just, um, you know, names on a, on a paper. So taking a look at this um, picture. Notice how, uh, looking at the cerebrum, how the brain looks really glossy, and it looks like there's some kind of like transparent um, tissue lying right on top of the brain, and that's the pia mater. So the pia mater clings to the surface of the CNS. It, it clings really tightly. In, in other words, it dips into all these crevices, so it's not just a flat encasement. It's really, you know, following all like the nooks and crannies of the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, the second layer out is called the arachnoid, and the arachnoid, um, let's take a look at the um, um, spinal cord uh, for a minute. And so the arachnoid, you can see, is kind of this uh, web-like structure on the outer periphery. Okay, so arachnoid creates a second layer. It's it's actually named after a spider web, so it's this wispy um, uh, layer of connective tissue that you could push, it, push aside with a blunt probe. And then the outer layer of the meninges is called the dura mater. That's here. Okay, so that's reflected back in this picture. So in other words, in order to get into uh, the brain or spinal cord, you'd have to cut through the dura mater. It's very tough. It's like leather. It's a tough encasement. So those are the three layers of the meninges. And then basically there's a, um, a gap in between those layers. So taking a look um, back at our notes, uh, the pia mater, we know that that's the inner layer. Okay, vascular, just meaning the blood vessels. It has a rich blood supply. It actually clings to the surface of the CNS, like we said. Now, because it's clinging to the surface of the CNS, there is no space underneath the pia mater. That is, you know, like shrink wrap to the CNS. 
but outside of the pia mater, there's going to be a little space called the subarachnoid space, called subarachnoid because we could think of it as being underneath the arachnoid, which is the middle layer. Like I said, this kind of web-like wispy layer. And then the space between the arachnoid and the outer layer is called the subdural space. Okay, and then the dura is the tough uh, outer encasement. So those are the three layers of the meninges. Now around the brain, uh, it's said that the dura mater is a double layer on the brain. It's, it's not quite um, a double layer, but let me show you what's meant by that. So let's take a look at a picture from the book. And let's just see if we can increase the size of this, this one, because this, this is a tough one um, to follow. It's actually easy to understand, but just harder for me to show you because there's so much that they're showing here. So here's the bone. We recognize that. And we know that the bone has a membrane that coats the outside of the bone called the periosteum. So there's the periosteum on the outside of the skull. Here's the periosteum on the inside of the skull. And so this pink layer, that's the dura mater. I'm going to switch marker colors here so that we can see this better. Okay, so here's the um, dura mater, right, the pink layer. And you notice how in some areas the dura mater, it's fused to the periosteum, like right here. Uh, and that's what you call the um, periosteal layer of the dura. Here, uh, the dura mater is not fused to the periosteum. And when the dura mater is not fused to the periosteum, notice how it creates a space in between the two. That space is called a dural sinus. That's where deoxygenated blood pools after it's been used by the brain prior to returning to the heart. Um, the areas that fuse to the periosteum and don't fuse to the periosteum are the same from person to person, so that's not a random thing. These dural sinuses have specific names and locations. We don't have to worry about that, but I just wanted to show you, it's not really like there's two layers of dura, it's just that you call it something different when it fuses to the periosteum compared to when it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it creates the dural sinus. So taking a look at that, uh, you can see the periosteal layer of the dura. Technically, it's just the periosteum fused to the dura, like I mentioned, and then the meningeal layer of the dura is the actual dura mater. And in some regions, it doesn't fuse to the inside of the skull, skull and that's uh, what's known as a dural sinus. So that's where venous blood pools before um, being returned to the heart. So the vertebral column is also encased by the meninges. I actually already showed you a picture of that, but I want to show you one more picture of the spinal cord of where it's different. So here we were saying that some of the dura will fuse to the inside of the skull, but in the case of the spinal cord, uh, this is the dura mater in gray. None of the dura mater is going to fuse to the inside of the vertebral column. As a matter of fact, you see how this space is filled with adipose tissue? That's known as the epidural space. So the epidural space is the space outside of the dura mater, okay, outside of the meninges, in between the meninges and the bone. And so most people have heard of the term epidural because it's a place of um, anesthetic delivery, right? So if we put a drug into this space, it would just affect these local nerves. So it's used for childbirth, it's used for, you know, hand surgeries and, you know, other procedures where we're just trying to um, get localized um, pain relief. So jumping back to our notes uh, and moving into the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid, as I mentioned, um, it's, it's produced inside of the uh, ventricles of the brain. Um, it's produced by just taking some of the blood uh, and secreting it into the, um, the uh, ventricles. And so what it does is it helps keep a constant composition, helps keep a pH. It reduces the weight of the brain by keeping the brain um, like buoyant. So you know how uh, we're lighter in a pool, how you can, you know, throw your friends around in the pool, uh, but, you know, maybe not so much on uh, land. So um, it does that. <clears throat> Pardon me, to the brain. Is, to the brain. Uh, it actually makes it uh, manageable for us to, you know, like, 
keep our head upright. I, it significantly reduces the uh, weight of the brain within the skull. But I'm going to show you some pictures and then we'll come back to this. So I'll just explain how this works. So we remember, hopefully, the ventricles. Um, okay, so taking a look again, here, here are the ventricles. Decrease the size of this again. Okay, so here are the ventricles, the two lateral ventricles, third ventricle, fourth ventricle. Each one of those ventricles contains um, tissue called the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus, there's four bunches of that tissue, if we want to call it that, one in each of the ventricles. And what the choroid plexus is, is um, ependymal cells. You might remember those from unit five. I'm going to remind you. So an ependymal cell is a type of neuroglial cell. It has cilia that projects from the surface into the fluid-filled ventricle. There's a single layer of these ependymal cells. And these ependymal cells, technically what they do is they surround a capillary uh, bed. So here they're showing us a blood vessel. This is representing the capillary, and you can see the ependymal cells are surrounding the capillary. And so you can see this is what we call the choroid plexus. So the choroid plexus is really just kind of like this capillary bed, this rich blood supply in each of the ventricles coated by these ependymal cells. So what the ependymal cells do is they take some of the plasma, the water, the electrolytes, um, some of the ions, uh, vitamins, uh, oxygen, it's just some of it. So none of the big things, the cells know, you know, um, proteins know, and it secretes this fluid into the ventricle. Uh, and that's what we call cerebrospinal fluid. So cerebrospinal fluid is technically just a um, subset of the plasma that's secreted into the ventricles. So take a look at this picture from the book. Here, what they're showing us is in red, this is the choroid plexus, okay, choroid plexus. So we can see the choroid plexus in some of the areas in this uh, mid-sagittal section. And the arrows are denoting that the choroid plexus is producing cerebrospinal fluid. So it's taking a subset of the plasma and it's filling the ventricles and it would fill the central canal as well. So here's a detail that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, there are three holes in the fourth ventricle. They're called apertures. Uh, let me show you. So going back to this picture, here's the fourth ventricle. Do you see these two holes in the side of the fourth ventricle? Okay, those two holes are the lateral apertures. There's two of the holes. We can't see the third opening because it's posterior and we're looking at the front of the brain, the anterior view. So taking a look at this view, do you see how they're showing us a hole right on midline in the back of the fourth ventricle? That's the median aperture. So I bring up these openings in the fourth ventricle because if we're producing cerebrospinal fluid in all of the ventricles, not only will it circulate in the ventricles and in the central canal, but you know it's going to leak out of these three holes, right? And so when it leaks out of these three apertures, it can't, we'll, we'll look at the brain picture of meninges for a minute, it can't uh, go underneath the pia mater because remember the pia mater is directly clinging to the surface of the CNS. So when cerebral spinal fluid leaks out, it's going to get stuck here, which is the subarachnoid space. Okay, so that's the subarachnoid space. You can see it's the space right underneath that uh, membrane known as the arachnoid. Uh, taking a look at this picture, reduce the size on this again. So they're trying to show us that. So here's the cerebrospinal fluid leaking out of the median aperture into the subarachnoid space. So this bright blue area would be the subarachnoid space. And so not only does the cerebrospinal fluid uh, fill the ventricles and the central canal, it also surrounds and bathes the outside of the central nervous system. Okay, so... Um, after it, it circulates because the ependymal cells are um, ciliated. So the way that the cerebrospinal fluid returns, you know, like gets circulated out of this area is uh, into those dural sinuses. So let's take another look at this. So cerebrospinal fluid at some point, it's in the subarachnoid space. Notice that where um, the arachnoid uh, is near a dural sinus, how it penetrates through the dura mater 
in like a little finger-like projection. This is what's known as an arachnoid villus. So here's an arachnoid villus, here's another arachnoid villus, and what happens is the cerebrospinal fluid diffuses out of the arachnoid villus into the deoxygenated blood. So it's a kind of a cool system, right, because it's derived from the blood and it returns to the blood. So we constantly produce cerebrospinal fluid, okay, we continually produce it, circulate it, we actually replace it a uh, number of times each day. So um, I wrote all this down for us. It's produced by the uh, choroid plexus, which is the vascular ependymal cells in each ventricle. A cerebrospinal fluid is secreted in each ventricle. It leaks out through the lateral and median apertures in the fourth ventricle into the subarachnoid space. And then when it returns to the blood. So it comes from the blood, it returns to the blood through an arachnoid villus that projects into the uh, dural sinus. And then it becomes part of the blood and it gets returned to the heart. And, um, and that's that for this video. So I'm going to talk about the cerebrum in another video. Thanks.